بسم الله ورس الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد First of all, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us in this blessed gathering to gather together in the one of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remember him as he subhanahu wa ta'ala should be remembered. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to benefit from this gathering, to benefit from each other, and that we can all take something beneficial from this humble effort to remember him subhanahu wa ta'ala and so I brought and thought it would be beneficial a very very important book of one of the scholars Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah ta'ala uh, a book called Kuwait al-Arba the four principles it's a very short treatise that the Sheikh rahimahullah ta'ala uh, wrote and it is a treatise which has to do with aqidah, with belief, and with some of the shubahat or some of the doubts of the mushrikeen and people amongst the Muslims who fell into uh, beliefs that are other than what is espoused in Kitabillah wa Sunnah to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So I'd like to begin in the muqaddama, in the beginning, by emphasizing the importance of knowledge in general and that in this regard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in the Quran Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has made it clear the importance of knowledge of the religion of Islam and that we need knowledge in order to practice uh, Islam correctly and so I wanted to begin by talking about the importance of knowledge. And in this regard, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Talab al-ilm faridatun ala kulli muslim. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that seeking the knowledge is a duty upon all Muslims, or every Muslim, the Muslim men and the Muslim women. And the ulama make it clear that this Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is referring to the ilm wajib, you know, the knowledge that is an obligation upon us, meaning knowledge of tawheed, knowledge of our salat, knowledge of uh, how to make tahara, and these kind of things is wajib upon every Muslim. But it is not an obligation for every single Muslim to necessarily be a talib al-ilm or a scholar or what have you. Not to discourage the people from knowledge, but of course, as long as some people from the community go out and seek the knowledge and seek the knowledge of those higher duties, for example, fara'id, you know, knowing uh, inheritance and other aspects of the religion, then the obligation will not be upon the rest of the community. There will be no sin upon the rest of the community as long as others take on that responsibility and duty. And so, I just wanted to discuss some of the important ahadith that mention the importance of knowledge. And in another hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, مَنْ يُرِدُ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفِقَّهُ فِي الدِّينَ يُفِقَّهُ فِي الدِّينَ so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives him knowledge and understanding of the religion." And the ulama also explained that what they call the mafhum of the hadith is that when Allah does not bless someone with knowledge that this is a this shows that Allah doesn't want khair for that person when the person is not benefiting in their religious knowledge you know elevating themselves to be able to practice the wajib knowledge the knowledge which is an obligation upon us all some of the benefits of this hadith that i just mentioned are as follows
that actually I'll, I'll move on to another hadith but anyway we got the gist of that hadith of the importance of knowledge in another hadith وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من سلق طريقا يلتمس فيه علما سهل الله سهل الله له به طريقا إلى الجنة that whenever the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that whoever traverses the path of knowledge that Allah سبحانه وتعالى will make his path his path to the paradise easy for him. So that we see that knowledge is a wasila. It's a means for getting to Jannah. That this shows us the sharaf or the, the great manzil and level of the people of knowledge. And so this is another encouragement for us to try to benefit ourselves and seek the knowledge. And in the explanation of this hadith, some of the ifada al hadith huna. So this hadith gives us some of the following benefits. Fadl talab al ilm. The benefit of seeking the knowledge is one of the first things. So one of the first things we gain is the benefit of seeking the knowledge. Wa anhu tariq dakhul al jannah. And that also this is a means or a way to enter Jannah. This is one of the paths to paradise. Is that we, by seeking the knowledge, and of course having ikhlas, you know, doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and having, uh, seeking ilm al-nafi', you know, beneficial knowledge, which means the sharia, that this is the means for us to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because by seeking the knowledge, you benefit yourself, but obviously the person who seeks the knowledge and passes on that knowledge, they benefit others. So this is the, by the intishar of ilm, we benefit, our, benefit ourselves and we benefit the community. So this is, these are some of the benefits of that hadith. Also another benefit of this hadith is that it shows us that by seeking the knowledge, a person becomes upon bayina. They become upon clarity. That when we seek knowledge of our religion, we rafa jahl, we uh, lift the ignorance from ourselves. So the more and more we seek knowledge, we benefit ourselves, we benefit the community, and we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala basira. We remove the ignorance that covered us before. Uh, another benefit that's mentioned is that by seeking the knowledge and that this is also shown in this hadith, وَيُرْشِدُهُ إِلَىٰ أَعْمَالْ الْبِرْ And that by seeking the knowledge, it guides us to righteous deeds. By seeking the knowledge, we know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly, and we know those deeds which are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more we seek the knowledge, the more we increase our ibadah. And as the ulama say, al-ilm or al-amal thamarat al-ilm, that the uh, doing righteous deeds and works is the fruits of seeking knowledge. So this is evidence or a person's, uh, a sign of a person's sincerity by if they're seeking the knowledge and they're bettering their practice and coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that knowledge, then this is showing the thamarat. This is what we want. Elm is not sought just for the sake of just uh, memorizing hadith, memorizing the ayats of the Qur'an, but then there's no ta'thir or there's no effect on your behavior. Your akhlaq is the same. Your manners are the same. You deal with your, bro- your Muslim brothers and sisters the same. You deal with the non-Muslims the same. But rather... By seeking the knowledge, it should have some uh, tat theater, it should have some effect upon our deeds. So, of course, this has an effect upon our limbs and upon our heart. And also by seeking the, ne- the, the, the knowledge, by seeking ilm, is it helps one to distinguish the truth from falsehood. By seeking knowledge, we can distinguish truth from falsehood. 
Okay? We can uh, distinguish Tawheed from Shirk. We can distinguish Sunnah from Bid'ah. All of this comes by elevating our knowledge, by increasing our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion. وَأَنْهُ أَيْدًا رضي الله عنه meaning on uh, Abi Huraira رضي الله عنه أنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من داء إلى هدى كان له من الأجر مثل أجور من تبعه لا ينقص ذلك من أجورهم شيئا رواه مسلم that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said in this hadith he said, whoever calls to guidance, it is that he will receive the ajr. Kana lahu min al ajr mithla ajur min tabahu. So that he will receive reward, and the person who follows him will receive reward, and it doesn't take anything from his reward. So meaning, if a talib al ilm or uh, a person, a da'i, who is calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they say one ayah, or one hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that the people gain benefit from. The fact that the people gain benefit from this, and practice this, they will receive reward, and that person will receive reward, for calling them, and reminding them of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this doesn't take any reward away from them. So in fact, this shows us the importance of seeking the knowledge and what? And calling the people to knowledge and calling the people to beneficial knowledge. And in another hadith, also talking about some of the benefits of seeking the knowledge, this is also a hadith mentioned, uh, narrated by on, uh, on Abi Huraira, radiallahu anhu qal, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا مات ابن آدم انقطع عمله إلا من ثلاث إلا من صدق جارية أو علم ينتفع به أو ولد صالح يدعو له رواه مسلم وأحمد. In this hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he said that when the when a person from Bani Adam, when a person dies, that all of his deeds will end or cease except three. And the first being Sadaqa Jariya. The first being the continuous charity, meaning if we build a masjid, or we maybe build a charity, or we build a Merkis a Sunnah, Merkis a Dawah, or we do something that the people uh, continually benefit from. Maybe we buy a building and it's for the homeless. Okay, we establish something that the people continue benefiting from. And the second thing the Prophet ﷺ mentioned after Sadaqa Jariya, he mentioned al ilm ilm yantafabi, meaning knowledge that the people benefit from. So, if a person maybe they write books, you know, beneficial books that teach the people about their Islam, or even pamphlets, or they're doing durus. Durus Musajjila, or whatever that they may be doing, that this is something that can benefit their soul after they die. And the third thing the Prophet ﷺ mentioned was a waladin salihan, yad'uluhu, is a righteous child that makes dua for him. So this right here emphasizes the importance for us to be concerned with our children. And especially in an environment like this, especially being in a non-Muslim environment where they go out, they go to the public schools, they hear uh, all kind of music. No matter how you try to give them good tarbiyah, they're getting bombarded with outside influences. Even if your daughter makes it, even if she makes it, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all the Muslim women and Muslim girls, I mean. But even if she makes it and she still maintains her virginity after high school, which is a very difficult thing to do. They're still, they have so much, uh, they've been in bombarded, they know things from the internet, they know things from just being in school, they've heard it, they know about it. It's not like the children, for example, that were raised in a Muslim country, if they were in Yemen, if they were in Saudi, if they were in 
possibly even Indonesia or any Muslim country, generally they are protected a lot more. And this just tends to be the case that in most of the Arab countries, the, which tend to be Muslim, alhamdulillah, is that they tend to protect their children more than in other countries. We see this. So just the fact of being in those lands, they tend to have a better tarbiyah. They're not infected with those things. So by just being here, we have a great difficulty. So the shahid or the point that I'm mentioning is that we have to be concerned with our children. And if we treat them and teach them the fada'il and the benefits of Islam, that perhaps they will be of those righteous children that will make dua for us when we are in our qabr, when we are in our graves. And that's very important to be concerned about the tarbiyah, be concerned about the well-being of your children, raise them righteously, and have them hopefully make dua for you and be a means for your entering Jannah and having some maghfirah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are just some of the benefits of seeking the knowledge and we could continue for lectures upon lectures if we were to mention the ahadith mentioning and the ayats mentioning the fada'il of seeking uh, knowledge and that it brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing I wanted to mention was that before getting into the book is the khuturat al-inhiraf because this book which means the dangers of going astray because by seeking the knowledge the knowledge helps us to stay on the straight path it helps us to be on the sirat al-mustaqim it helps us to stay away from shirkiyat and bid'ah wa khurafat and those things which take us away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and take us away from uh, following the religion correctly and in this regard I will just read a few statements uh, in regards to how to beware and the dangers of going astray and the reasons why people fall into these these dangers. Asbab al-inhiraf an aqidat sahiha So the reasons that people go astray from the correct belief. These are some of the re- reasons. Al-inhiraf an aqidat sahiha muhlaka wa diya wal muslim bila aqidat sahiha yakun yakun faris lil awham wa shukuk alati rubama tatarakam alayhi fatuhajibu anhu aw ru'ya as sahiha wal inhiraf an aqida as sahiha lahu asbab kathira min ahimha tayyib so by when we some of the reasons and the dangers of having incorrect belief is that for one it leads to a person's destruction and also a, it leads to a person uh, a muslim being in a sense worthless kind of wasted wasted in the sense that not meaning he's outside of the fold of islam but wasted in that he is not practicing his religion properly so he's making kathra to mistakes you know many mistakes maybe he's falling into bid'a maybe he's falling into shirkiyat because he's not having correct belief so this is why it's important for us always to try to seek the knowledge especially related to tawhid to correct our belief and that a muslim without correct belief maybe he falls into doubtful matters and he is actually in reality very weak he's very weak without correct strong foundation in aqidah in belief some of the important uh reasons that a person uh that leads to a person having incorrect belief are the first being a jahl a jahl bi hadi rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam bi ragam من حب من حب الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم. so having ignorance of the guidance of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and that love of the believers 
for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger is wajib. This is wajib upon the believers to have love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But having ignorance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of correct uh, aqidah and correct tawheed, you can't possibly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly because you don't know who He is. The more we increase our knowledge and we have aqidah as sahiha then we're able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala basira. And we're able, that increases our love for Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. So, a jahl is one of the things that creates deviance. And in this regard, or mentioning the second thing, I'll mention the second thing that the author mentioned. He said, ittiba, uh, ittiba al hawa. That following one's desires. This is the second thing which leads us astray from correct aqidah. And when a person falls into, as Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, he mentioned two things related to hawa. That a person can, be, can follow their shubahat or they could be following their shahwat. And the shubahat meaning that they follow doubtful matters. And this means when a person has incorrect aqidah, they fall into shubahat. They fall into doubtful matters because they don't know what is correct. They don't know what is correct from what is misguidance. And when they fall into shahwat, this means following their desires, meaning they're following into, maybe they follow into zina or the things that lead to zina, meaning they could be into, uh, you know, looking at the muharramat or what any kind of uh, um, any kind of things that have to do with our desires, whether it be f- drinking al- alcohol or any kind of maasi. But so Shaykh al Islam divided it into those two types that that inhiraf falls into those th- two things: either your shubahat, either you know having correct uh, incorrect belief, or a shahwat, following your desires, falling into uh, the sins and the maasi. In the Salaf, the pious predecessors, they used to view that the shubahat ashad min ashahawat. You know, following into uh, innovation in related to the uh, the religion of Islam was a shed was more dangerous than following one's desires. And there is a narration, and I'll just give the general meaning of Ibn Sirin, where he saw his son leaving the house of a person who was deviant in his aqidah. He saw him leaving he saw his son leaving this man's house. And he says, I would have rather he said this to his son, I would have rather that you left the house of a person who was an alcoholic, a person who committed adultery, or a person who was a muhannith, meaning like they were uh, a man who is very feminine, or they could be almost like a homosexual, or these kind of things, a'udhu billah min dhalik. So he said, I would have rather have seen you leave one of those individuals' house, than leave the house of so-and-so who is an innovator. Because the Salaf knew the danger that the people who innovated in the religion, they were changing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hukum in a, in a sense. They're changing the ruling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're changing the... Uh, affairs of the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and they're making the Sunnah appear to be uh, they're making the Sunnah appear to be Bid'ah and Bid'ah appear to be Sunnah and this shows us the great danger and there's many narrations related to this on the Salaf which would take up a lot of our time and that's not the subject that we're talking about but I just wanted to bring these things out because these are some of the things that make us go away from the correct Aqidah and of course, knowledge, by seeking the knowledge, the correct knowledge, this helps us to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this helps us to have the correct aqidah. The third thing that was mentioned is a ta'asab li ara arijal. That blind following or having prejudice to the opinions of individuals. So, this is also another reason why people go astray. 
They say, no, 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 we do it like this back home. Or our, my sheikh says like this, and so we have to follow like this. He doesn't care about what the sunnah, what the Prophet has said. Prophet said this, but he says, no, our kabila does this, our tribe does this, or so and so from our tribe who's a sheikh, he said this, and we go with that. But no, instead, we are ordered to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad and seek the correct knowledge and stay away from the dangers. And in this regard, I just wanted to end as far as the introduction, with a couple of narrations from the imams of the sunnah, which are, are known to the Muslims everywhere. No matter what, almost no matter what their aqidah, as long as they're in the fold of Islam, they all respect the imams, the four imams, the fuqaha, Imam, uh, imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, wa, uh, Imam Ahmed, radiallahu anhum, ajma'een. For... I wanted to mention a couple of the narrations of what they said about Ta'asa because this is a problem we have as many people they say well no in our country it's Shafi'i in our, in our, our country where uh, we follow Imam Abu Hanifa or we follow Imam Ahmed only but none of those Imams called to themselves they all called they said basically what it means if you hear a hadith uh, then that's my madhab then this is my way don't follow me leave me, if I go against the sunnah, if I go against something sahih. And so we'll read actually some of their narrations, some of their statements. This is a statement of Imam Abu Hanifa, Nu'man ibn Thabit, rahimahullah ta'ala. He said, إِذَا سَحَ hadith فَهُوَ madhabi." That if a hadith is proven to be sound, then this is my madhab. My madhab, my minhaj, my methodology, is following the correct hadith, you know, if a hadith is proven to be sound, meaning the hadith of Prophet wasallam. So don't follow my qawl, my statement, if it goes against the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. So we're ordered to follow the sunnah, not men. And every man can make a mistake. As the Prophet wasallam said, Kulum ibn Adam khata, khata wa khayran khata'ina tawabun. So... We're ordered to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Imam Malik ibn Anas rahimahullah ta'ala laysa ahad bada nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam illa yukhidh yukhidh min qawlihi wa yatraq ila nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam that there is no one after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam except that you can take from his statement and leave his statement. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the only one ala itlaq Without any exception, you take and you fully follow. Even the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, ajma'een, we don't blind follow uh, individuals of the Sahaba. Not taking away from their manzil or their station. But just knowing that the, the Prophet ﷺ is who we're ordered to follow. And of course the Khulafa Rashidin, as the Prophet has said in the authentic hadith, وَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةَ خُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِينَ عَدُوا عَلَيْهَا بِنَوَادِجْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمَحْتَثَرَ الْأَمُورِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِدَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ و... و... وقال في حديث آخر آه... وَمَنْ كَانَ عَلَى مِثْلِ وَمَا كَانَ عَلَيْهِ وَأَسْحَابِي That the Prophet ﷺ said Whoever is upon what I'm upon and my, what my companions upon then you know this is the correct method this is the correct minhaj you know, meaning, and the Khulafa al-Rashidin. You know, the four Khulafa al-Rashidin, Abu Bakr, wa Umar, wa Uthman, wa Ali, radiallahu anhum, ajma'een. So, but even with that, we're not ordered to, blind, to blindly follow them, but they were united in ittiqad. They were united in aqidah. You won't find mukhalafat uh, 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 between the Sahaba in aqidah. They may in Amur, in some issues of fiqh, and maybe because a hadith reached one and another, you know, was closer to the Prophet ﷺ. In these matters, there's room for, uh, there's room for uh, some differences there. But as far as uh, uh, ittiqad and aqidah, the Sahaba and the Salaf were united upon that. And that's what we follow. That's when we say we follow the minhaj or the methodology of the Salaf al meaning the first, uh, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, we itba'a Tabi'een. So, going back to the subject, I, I'll end with uh, the qawl of Imam uh, Shafi'i, 
رحمه الله تعالى قال أجمع المسلمون على أنه من استبان من استبان له سنة 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 عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لم يهل لأحد أن يدعها لقول أحد that the Muslims are united there's a consensus with the Muslims that if a, a sunnah is authentic if it's a, a, a authentic hadith authentic narration of the Prophet wasallam, that we cannot refute that sunnah or that hadith in conjunction with anyone else's statement so we always take the statements of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam over the coal of, of anyone. And then there are statements of Imam Ahmed, but I just wanted to bring those statements in regards to the proof of not following that the four Imams, they ordered the people to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam and not follow them blindly or follow anyone uh, blindly. So going back to the subject at hand, I'll just be brief and just go with a, a very brief introduction of the book of the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala Qala Shaykh Muhammad ibn Dohab Rahimahullah Ta'ala Qala Bismillah Rahman Rahim Qala Shaykh Al-Islam Muhammad ibn Dohab Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab Rahimahullah Ta'ala Asallallah Kareem Rabb Al-Arsh Al-Adheem An yatawallaka fi dunya wal akhira Wa an yaj'alaka mubarakan aynama kunt Wa an yaj'alaka minman idha utiya Utiya shakr, with the ubtila sabr, with the adnaba stakfar, for in the haulai thalatha unwan saada. So the Shaykh Muhammad ibn Duhab rahimahullah ta'ala, he began his book, The Four Principles, with a, a dua for the people, for the readers of the book. And the ulama, they explained that, that when a teacher and you'll find this in, in some of the books of the Salaf, that they used to make dua for the reader. And that when the person is teaching, and they make dua for the listener, this in, makes their heart more inclined to hear what, they, what they're speaking about. You know, this softens the heart of the listener. If your teacher is, you see that they're sincere, and they have a sincere love for you, especially if it's a love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're making Dua for you, Allah you have for the, you know, uh, you know, and they they express that they love you for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. This makes your heart more open to the message that they're trying to deliver. So the Sheikh began by making dua, and he said, which what translated what means, I ask Allah the Most Generous, the Lord of the Throne, to protect you in this world and in the hereafter, and to bless you wherever you are and to make you from those who are grateful when they are given, patient when they are tested, and those who seek forgiveness when they are in sin, when they've committed a sin, for verily those are the three signs of happiness. So the Shaykh began with this dua, and this dua for the listener, in order to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give mercy upon them, and also to have their hearts open to the message that he was bringing. And in this regard, the ulama, they mention as far as the, the shukr, having thanks for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that having, being thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way in which we do this in the sharia, is by recognizing the ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us. And by following that recognition by doing acts of ibadah. So when we are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a way of expressing shukr. This is a way of expressing our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And evidence for this is the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha qalat Kana nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yuqum min al-layl hatta tatafattara qadamahu fa kultu lahu lima tasna hadha ya rasulullah 
وَقَدْ غُفِرَ لَكَ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَتَأَخَّرَ قَالَ أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا شُكُورًا So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha narrated that she said to the that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to uh, stand in the night prayer until his feet began to swell and she said to him O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam why are you doing this when you have been forgiven for your sins uh, for the sins that you did before and what may occur after you're forgiven for all your sins and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded by saying shouldn't I be a thankful slave shouldn't I be a grateful slave so this shows us again gratefulness is by being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the proof that one is being grateful and by being by having qiyama layl which is a uh, is very difficult on most of us to get up in the depths of the night and use cold water in order to prepare ourselves for the prayer when no one is is there to encourage us and maybe if we're married we're leaving our bed leaving the warm bed to get up and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is a way of showing shukr this is a way of showing thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is by doing being obedient this is how we show shukr as-sahih to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala and the other dua the shaykh made for us so he he made the dua that we're grateful that when we're given and that we're patient when we are tested and there are so many verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh the benefits of being uh, patient as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Allah ma sabirin that Allah is with those who are patient so being patient when we're tested when we're in trials as the Muslims are going through trials everywhere and as individuals were tested that be, being patient Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 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 with us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows our struggle and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can deliver us from our struggle if we continue to be patient and be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all to be of those who are patient when we are tested ameen the next thing in this dua that the shaykh mentioned and he said and those who seek forgiveness when they sin and I'll end this so as not to continue with being uh, you know to to make it too long for the people that in regards to being pay, uh, in regards to uh, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that he sought forgiveness from his Lord more than 70 times and I believe in another narration more than 100 times a day sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so if this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what about us we should always be making istighfar and we should always be making toba and I'll end by just talking very briefly about the conditions for toba qala imam nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala qala ulama so imam nawawi said and he said that uh, about the, that the ulama the scholars of islam that they say a toba to wajibatun that toba is an obligation. Toba is an obligation. The ulama have agree upon this. Min kulli them fa in kanat masiya or fa in kanat masiya bain al abdi wa bain Allah Taala la that la ta taalak bi haq al adami falaha thalath shurut. So if the sin that a person commits is between, it has to do with the haq of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It has to do with the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, it doesn't have to do with the rights of another individual. For example, uh, if you had ghibah or namima, you were speaking slanderous about someone. You were lying about someone. You took something from someone. You stole something. You took their land illegally. Whatever it is you, you did to them illegally. This has to do with another person. So this has to do with their right. 
But if it has to do with the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, its other sins, then your toba has three conditions. And the first condition, the, fir- the first condition that the ulama mentioned, ahaduha an yukhli'a an masiyah, an yukhli'a an masiyah, is that the person leaves the sin. The person, they leave and they stay away from the sin. So this is the first condition of make uh, of uh, making toba. Wathani and yandama ala fi'liha, and that the person should feel sadness about the sin that they're doing or that they just committed. So the first thing is leaving the sin. The second thing is feeling sadness. Wathalith and yazama and la yuda ilaha abadin. Fuqida ahad thalatha lam tasih toba tuhu. So that the third thing being that the person is determined not to return to that sin, uh, is determined to never return to that sin. And if one of those conditions is not met, then this is not considered toba in Islam. This is not considered correct toba, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will not accept from you. And if the sin has to do with the rights of an individual, the rights of other uh, individuals and human beings, then you should strive to return that thing that you did. If it, if it was something you stole from an individual, then you should try to return their, his or her property, or you lied about them, or you made riba, then you should try to ask for their forgiveness, or at least if you maybe feel shyness about this, then maybe have someone else on your behalf return that property or uh, or uh, you know return their rights on your behalf and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this from us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with ilm nafia wa rizqan tayyiba wa amalan mutaqabbila wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in